welcome to Dream Peaches. This is episode six, and the topic is faces, eyes, and body parts found in the film The Labyrinth. Uh, I am Jesse, and I am the one doing the podcast here. <laughs> um, so despite what you may think, uh, there's a surprising amount of body parts found within the film. Uh, and it's so much so that it's uh, very questionable. And it kind of leads you to ask, like, what does it mean? Why, why are all these body parts being found in this film? So I decided that we would start at the top and kind of work our way down. Um, so, okay, before we begin, let me plug my website real quick. Dreampeaches.net. Uh, it's a fan site originally set up uh, to help out with fan fiction writers um, in, by way of editing. Uh, and now it, there's like a free forum there that you can sign up for and, and participate in. And it's just all about uh, labyrinth and stuff. And I have all the anti-spam stuff up there. <laughs> so it's um, kind of free and void of, of spammy stuff. Anyway, dreampeaches.net. Now let's, uh, let's start with the head. When we look at different parts of the head that can be found in Labyrinth, uh, we find actually a, quite a number of things. Um, there's a lot of faces, and we even have um, eye lichen, which might not be the most prominent eye, but they are a bunch of different eyes. So uh, let me start with the seven faces of Jareth. Um, okay, oops. Let me start by getting the eyelash out of my own eye. Okay. The seven faces of Jareth. In Labyrinth, uh, Jareth's face appears seven different times throughout the film, uh, when not attached to his body. <laughs> uh, so this subconsciously allows the viewers to grasp that Jareth is um, kind of everywhere all at once. Uh, he's kind of this all-knowing kind of figure. He knows what's going on within his kingdom at all times. It also indicates that uh, he has a higher level of power because we don't see this with any other character. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you where to find all seven faces. Um, if you want to skip this and look for them yourself, then I will put down here, um, what time what points to like skip ahead to. <laughs> okay, so number one. After Sarah enters the labyrinth, uh, the face appears in the right hand corner. Sarah and Hoggle, the, number two, Sarah and Hoggle climb uh, the ladder like right after the cleaners and Jared's face can be seen in the, uh, kind of like the rocks of the tunnel. Jarrett's face appears again um, on the left side of an obelisk on the floor uh, right after they have the conversation with the wise man. His face appears again in the top left-hand corner um, when, like right after Sarah frees Ludo and Hago gets all angry and grumbly. Uh, five, when Jareth gives the poison peach to Hoggle, his, his face, this is, um, the most obvious one. It's like three rocks, um, that form his face and Jareth is literally leaning against those rocks. So it's really hard to miss that one. Um, six, as soon as the ledge crumbles down in the bog of eternal stench, um, Jareth's face appears. And the last one, um, as soon as Sarah and her team kind of leave the bog of eternal stench, his face appears in the trees. So, okay, it is safe now if you want to return. <laughs> All right, so the next, uh, the next thing I want to look at is Hoggle's vest. Hoggle, I mean, that doesn't sound like it's, um, part of the head, right? But Hoggle's vest has faces on it. 
Um, in fact, he wears like this kind of leathery looking piece together vest and it's made of three different faces. Um, that's kind of a creepy thought in itself. Um, you know, the question is, is it a decorative vest Decor like made to look that way? Or did he leather up some faces and he's pulling like an Ed Gein kind of a thing? Um, I don't know. Attention fanfic writers, that could be a horror fanfic. <laughs> um, anyway, why would Hoggle need these extra faces? Like, why would he, why would he actually wear a vest with a leather vest of faces? It, it's kind of, it's so bizarre. Um, if we include his own, then he has four faces. And if you want to look into the symbolism here, uh, cherubim, which are the chubby kind of child looking angels are said to have four faces. Um, they are also considered to be protectors, guardians of places, messengers. Um, sometimes they're depicted as um, storm winds or the bringers of storm winds. And so where did we first meet Hoggle? He's at the gate where he comes off as being the groundskeeper, right? And a groundskeeper is kind of a guardian of the grounds that they keep. Uh, and once Sarah steps through the gate, uh, into the initial stone maze there. Uh, it looks like there's been a big windstorm that's blown all these tree branches all over the place. So there might be something to that. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. All right. Uh, I want to bring up the false alarms. Okay, so if anyone is curious, there are a total of eight false alarms in the film. Uh, false alarms are giant stone heads that talk and they dispatch warnings, which is just their job. Um, they only appear underground and they fully acknowledge their deception, especially when they are pressed about it. So, uh, big giant heads, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, the next thing would be the eye lichen. Um, I lichen, it's like a, it's a plant and it is, has the ability to follow movement. Uh, and we see this when Sarah passes by, um, and it, it just watches them. So I also, I think this is one way that Jareth is able to see things going on through his crystals. Um, and one thing I, I found to be kind of odd is how comfortable Sarah is with the eye lichen. Uh, she never flinches around it or stops to give it a once over. And like when she meets the worm, the eye lichen is close enough to touch her shirt and she absolutely does not care. <laughs> she gives like two shits. So let me, let me like post a photo of that here. Okay. Cause yeah, she just absolutely does not care. If it was me, I would care. And I think I would, I would have to like at least examine it. Okay, so the next part uh, I want to talk about um, our hands. Um, I'll talk about the short one first. Okay, so oh gosh, sorry. It's uh, it has started to snow in Alaska, and and it's like sucking up all the moisture and it's making everything dry. So my nose is itchy. All right, so direction post hands. Um, during the dance magic dance scene, uh, Sarah has like that table lipstick and she's marking um, the tiles and stuff. And she does pass by this strange directional marker that has all these different hands pointing in different directions, uh, but nothing is labeled and it doesn't seem helpful in the slightest. So I don't know why it's there um, other than decor, like as a decoration, um, cause it is ultimately not helpful. Okay. So, um, the next 
part of this um, would be the helping hands. Helping hands uh, functions as both hands and as hand creatures who can actually speak to Sarah. And they're kind of in this uh, vertical tunnel thing, right? So symbolically, hands can symbolize strength, power, protection, generosity, hospitality, and or stability. Um, in this instance, they claim to be helping, but Sarah states that they are hurting. Uh, and I don't know if they really know what the difference is because they're hands, you know? Uh, anyway, so they present her with a choice of going up or down and they, they don't have any preamble to what is below. And we kind of have an idea of what is up top because we see it for like a split second, right? Uh, in fact, maybe I can find a picture of that. All right. So Sarah doesn't bother asking what's below. She just kind of blurts out, guess I'll go down, right? And that's where they send her <clears throat> down to the oubliette. Uh, so are these hands really helpful? Um, I guess that is the question. Uh, it seems like it's kind of a lesson that Sarah failed to pick up on. Um, ask questions before making big decisions. Um, some people have wondered if the hands are groping Sarah, but like it's literally a vertical tube of hands, right? And where they <laughs> like they can't help but hang on to her to keep her in one place. So I don't think they're groping her. Um, there might have been like some accidental groping, but. I think that's probably about it. Okay, so next thing I want to do is talk about the torso. So from the neck down to the crotch, right? Okay. So uh, we have the knockers. Let me let me just say that's an obvious term for breasts, <laughs> and I'm. I'm sure that there's some deep dive that I am not thinking of, but uh, I don't know. They, they just seem so indicative of boobs. I just have to wonder, like, they both have these rings and what is that? Like nipple piercings or something. You know, it's a deep dive. It's a big reach. Um, I mean, they also speak and boobs don't speak. So... Anyway, I just want to bring up the knockers. Every time I see them, I say to myself, What knockers? Oh, thank you, doctor. Yeah, just like from young Frankenstein or Frankenstein. I guess it depends on how you want to pronounce it. <laughs> okay. Next up is uh, a fan favorite, Jarrett's Bulge. So I'm only going to mention this briefly because I had a discussion with this uh, or about this with my sister the other day um, to kind of gather some of her thoughts on it. And she thinks it can be its own episode. So if you agree with that, um, I do have a poll going on over at dreampeaches.net on the forum. Uh, you can voice your opinion. You can send me an email. If you have opinions or comments or anything like that, um, go ahead and email me about that uh, and I will get you included in that particular podcast episode. Um, I think it probably is going to be an episode. I just don't know if I'm going to do it now or maybe later. Um, I don't know. Anyway, let's get back to the bulge. So, it progressively grows in size during the film because it was perceived as being completely hilarious by Jim Henson, Terry Jones, David Bowie, and Brian Froud. Um, that's just the way British humor is. If it offends you, I don't care. And I don't think any of the, of the other <laughs> Labyrinth fanfic writers or anything, I don't think they care either. Um, it's funny. Since we follow Sarah through the labyrinth, it probably represents her increased attraction to Jareth since he goes from 
being like the main bad guy who she has to defeat to being like this dreamy romantic dance partner and then she kind of gets to the end and he she's supposed to defeat him she doesn't seem as eager as she was in the beginning um so maybe maybe it's a reflection of that um could it mean something else for Jareth? I mean, it is his body part that is enlarging. So um, he does tell Sarah at the end that he became what she expected of him. So she wanted a villain, so he became one. She wanted a cower, so he became frightening. Uh, perhaps this is another reflection of what she wanted. Uh, I don't know. So anyway. Let me reiterate this. This might become its own episode. Please go to dreampeaches.net and let me know if that's something you would like me to talk about. Um, and if you have your own commentary and stuff, also send me an email about that. Um, I think I think you should let me know if we if we should take a deep dive into Jared's tights to discuss his bulge. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so last but not least for the torso, the Bog of Eternal Stench. Um, and I, I have to say, since I did talk to my sister about this before, before filming, uh, she was not as enthused. She thought this was my biggest reach. Um, but for me, this is something that's always kind of been in my brain since I first watched the movie. Uh, the Bog of Eternal Stench, it has this really winding pathway and it's full of like fart noises and foul odors. And it's not, it's not your most like in your face body parts, but it kind of reminds me of like intestines or like the, you know, the intestinal tract. <laughs> um, for me, I always, one word really stood out for me with with the bog of eternal stench and that was indigestion so i don't know if that's uh something that other people have thought of but it's definitely something that comes to my mind okay last but not least i have one other one other body part to discuss with you um because we get no legs or feet in the film uh that i was able to notice what we do get are the fieries parts, uh, which are completely detachable and reattachable. And it's very, very bizarre. Um, <laughs> Cause we even see them pile together and move as like one entity and it's, it's weird and a little disturbing. So, okay. So out of all the creatures in the film, I found fieries to be the most threatening. Um, because they're the only ones to really threaten Sarah's life while they were singing and dancing about it. And they, they were, could really care less, right? They wanted to remove her head and she was able to get out of there without that happening. But uh, I don't know, they, they always seem so strange, so bizarre. Um, and then I, I had to like really kind of think about the fireys, you know, because I, I know that they represent something, but I'm not 100% sure what. And the one thing that I came up with was um, plastic surgery. So, I don't know. Do you need a new nose? Do you need new boobs? It's very much like a child's way of thinking of plastic surgery. Um, and it's almost in the way of Mr. Potato Head parts. So, you just pop something off and put it back in its place. Um, and then you have, you have that new thing. So new nose, you just pull yours off, put another one on and you know, you're good to go. Uh, so I, I was thinking about the film in the way of plastic surgery and Sarah's stepmother doesn't really look like she recently had a child. Um, so maybe she had some plastic surgery to help account for that. Um, maybe Sarah's biological mother, who's an actress, um, had some plastic surgery and she's trying to wrap her head around that. 
Um, maybe Sarah herself is considering getting plastic surgery uh, sometime in the future to make her feel more appealing. So I, I don't know. Um, I would like to hear what your thoughts are on the fireys because I think they're pretty fascinating in, in of themselves. Um, and that's, I don't know. Anyway, that's all that I could think of for that. All right. <clears throat> so what have we learned from this perspective of the labyrinth? There are some things that I'm surprised we didn't see, like um, more mouth fe features and more eyes, eye features. Uh, so I have a picture here that I found. It's um, the entrance from the gardens of Bamarzo, Italy. Um, that's a, it's like a creature statue garden. And you can, <laughs> if you are so inclined, you can visit uh, this place in Italy and actually wander through and see a lot of really cool things. Um, I haven't gone there, but I would like to at some point in the future. Anyway, I'm surprised that we just didn't see something like this in the film. I think it really could have added some sort of uh, extra ambiance, you know, may maybe, maybe something like that could be featured, I don't know, in a, fu in a future film, which never seems to happen, or fanfic or whatever. Anyway, um, so let me ask you, could we be seeing parts of the labyrinth that indicate that it's a giant living kind of earthen being uh, itself, you know, they, we see, we see this happen in fanfics all the time where uh, the labyrinth gets personified and sometimes it shows itself in like a humanoid form uh, so it can interact with other characters. Um, but the lab, but in those fan fictions, like the labyrinth is its own creature, you know, and that's why it moves around and shifts uh, walls and stuff. Okay. Another thought that I had, what if these things like the seven faces of Jareth, uh, the false alarms, the helping hands and all that, what if they are extensions of Jareth's own body? So that tunnel of hands, what if <laughs> the whole tunnel of hands is, is just numerous Jareth hands? What if the false alarms are all just Jareth as false alarms? Like, it's kind of a weird thought, um, but my my brain was was telling me if he can project his face across the land, then why not project himself as these stone false alarms or helping hands or whatever else? I don't know. Okay, so, okay, <clears throat> the next episode is going to be a little academic. It's going to be on anti-consumerism. Uh, I found this article. It's, it's a weird article. It's, it's, um, I guess it's like an academic article. It's called Anti-Consumerism in Labyrinth by D.R. Burns from 2012. And it discusses uh, Labyrinth as being about anti-consumerism. So I will link that uh, in the YouTube video below. It's, it's available on the website under articles. Um, and it's also going to be in the, on the website forum. So it's a little easier to find. Um, and like read it. And, and start gathering some thoughts. Um, I also will probably touch on some economics, um, the question of what is valuable or what is of value in the film Labyrinth. Um, and also, you know, just with like goblins and, and fairy kind and stuff in folklore. Um, this doesn't have to strictly be um, about the film, I always, I always like to talk about folklore, the folklore aspect of it. Um, if you are interested in the goblin market, 
Um, you could always tie that in with some of this as well. Um, there's a lot of, of kind of kind of economic adjacent um, writings on that as well. Anyway, I have some of those linked um, on the forum. So anyway, it, I'm interested in your thoughts, your comments, your questions, all that kind of stuff. You can uh, email me your audio or video submissions. Um, so you can be part of the podcast. It's jesse at dreampeaches.net. Uh, the website is dreampeaches.net. Uh, and I would also really like to uh, extend an invite to anyone who has a topic they would love to discuss. Um, I wouldn't mind having a guest or two. <laughs> um, so if you're interested, reach out, tell me what you would like to um, be on the podcast about. Uh, if you're a fanfic writer and you want to really have something about um, fanfic writing, like that'd be kind of cool too. Um, I'm open to a lot of different things. Anyway, I think this is going to be it for me for today. Uh, next time it will be on anti-consumerism. And also, please let me know if you think we need to do a deep dive into Jarrett's pants about his bulge um, and make that its own episode. <laughs>